What we do know quite a lot about, however, is Minoan clothing. And we know a lot about it because of the wall art that was left behind and because of sculptures. And this was it. Already, just looking at this lovely illustration, I think we can see that these people were living the good life. Um, fashion is not an island, it's a response. And to dress like this, your life is good, right? Not much of a daily struggle for food or comfort or warmth. This was a sunny, prosperous, and a presumably happy culture. Because look at the way they dress. Let's break it down. A tightly fitting sleeved bodice tailored to expose the breasts. Obviously, the breast was in no way taboo in Minoan culture. In fact, it was something that was shown off. A tightly cinched waist, cinched in with a belt. A decorative apron that was often padded. And then these bell-shaped skirts constructed of layers of different sorts of fabrics with different designs sewn together in ruffled tiers. So it really gives the first hourglass silhouette. Now this Minoan silhouette, which is thousands of years old, would come back into fashion later on, as we'll see in a second. On um, uh, the upper part of the body, the head, incredibly elaborately coiffed hair, accessorized with bronze or gold bands of beads or ribbons. So these were people who had time to do their hair elaborately. It was a very decorative look and a very colorful look. Now, remember I just said that these were the first to give us an hourglass silhouette with the large breast, cinched waist and full hips. Well, that would come back into fashion at the turn of the 20th century. Um, in the early part of the 20th century with this, this incredible hourglass silhouette that was achieved by corsetry. And then, of course, the hourglass would become popular again in the 1950s. But it started here in Minoan culture. What about menswear? There wasn't much menswear because... Uh, Basically, guys just wore decorative and colorful loincloths made from different fabrics and leathers, sometimes padded and often with a, a sort of cod piece to protect the penis. And one can only imagine that uh, these cod pieces were uh, often slightly exaggerated in the same way that uh, Egyptian men overly starched. Their shenties at the front to suggest a large penis. We can only assume that Minoan men did the same. Gold, bronze or leather armbands. And then a feathered fitted headdress. And of course, for both men and women, all of this could be uh, and would be topped with a cloak. Like this. Minoan men had beautiful, long, curly hair. And uh, the look, if you actually look at it, it's all very sinuous. It's extremely exotic and very, very colorful. So um, think about the Egyptian aesthetic. It was very geometric. Even their clothing was very geometric. Their wigs were very geometric. Minoan culture was completely about swirling, linear, curvilinear, sinuous shapes. Completely different, but equally exotic. And of course, I never leave a culture without showing you the influence that culture had on fashion today. Let's take a look at the Minoan influence on today's fashion. Take a look at this. The ruffled tears and that bell-shaped uh, silhouette. This, I really believe the designer was um, intentionally updating the Minoan look with the bell-shaped ruffled tears and then a bodice that exposes the breasts. And take a look at the structure of the top half of this suit with that um, scalloped shape neckline that would expose the breasts if there wasn't um, a feature that covered them up. But it's completely the same, isn't it, as the structure of the Minoan bodice. And take a look at this, completely Minoan. And I think that this was how vi exactly as vibrant and colorful as a Minoan costume actually was. And on Project Runway a couple of years ago, one of their challenges was to create 
a Minoan inspired outfit and I think that this designer just basically copied Minoan fashion by the letter. And remember those uh, colourful multi-textiled loincloths that uh, Minoan men wore? Well, here we see it in a skirt. And look at these two fashion shoots. I would argue that they were completely inspired by the legend of the Minotaur. Okay, Mycenaean clothing. As you can see there, it's awfully similar to Minoan clothing. In fact, there is little to distinguish Mycenaean female costume from a Noan female costume other than the fact that they occasionally covered their breasts with either an inner garment, a bodice structured to cover the breasts, or more probably, just a piece of fabric tucked into their tight-fitting scallop-shaped bodices. Yet, we think that this covering of the breasts probably had more to do with a fashion fad than any kind of modesty. And here you can see it's kind of that a uh, uh, Minoan bodice, but with the breasts covered. It's Mycenaean male fashion that really changes things up. You can see here that men wore tunics. They did not just wear a loincloth and a fabulously feathered cap. No, they wore structured tunics like this, um, usually with sleeves not three-quarter length that, that fell just just uh, before the elbow starts with these very square necklines trimmed. So the bigger difference is seen in menswear. Mycenaean men abandoned the solitary loincloth in favor of these uh, elbow-length trimmed boat neck tunics. But get this, the tunic would become the foundation for clothing throughout the Greek, Roman, Dark Age and Medieval evil eras for both genders and it would be worn as an undergarment in later centuries. The tunic is still worn today and is arguably fashion's biggest and most enduring success story. All right, sort of overlapping but really kind of one and the same. The next culture we're going to look at is really classical Greece. What you think of when you think of ancient Greece. Let's look at Greek fashion. We still talk about Grecian drape, don't we, when we talk about clothing, a dress with a Grecian drape. Well, of course, this comes from ancient Greece. Let's take a look at their costume. Really, there are three items of clothing that I want you to learn because they were the three items of clothing that made up the Grecian wardrobe. The kind of clothing worn in ancient Greece was loose and flowing and hardly ever were garments sewn together. The fabric, fabrics used were mainly linen and wool. We've seen that before. Women also wore a veil with their clothing whenever they stepped out of the house. Remember, women were not encouraged to go outdoors. In fact, the ancient Greek fashion outlook was quite modern as far as men were concerned to the extent that male nudity was no big deal in ancient Greece. Uh, guys could go out uh, with minimal clothing, whereas a woman actually had to be quite... There were three types of clothing in ancient Greece, as I just told you, and you really do have to learn what they are. The sheeton. The, she the sheeton. This was worn in the ancient Grecian society by men as well as women. It was the unisex item. This was a form of clothing that was very popular. The chiton would be worn with a hymation, which we'll look at in a second, or it could be worn without a hymation. A belt was also often worn with a chiton. This was called a zoster. Now, that's a fun word. The Doric chiton. Remember the Doric column? So the Doric chiton uh, mirrors the Doric column, consisted simply of two pieces of cloth, which were rectangular in sh shape, and worn long and then secured on the shoulder on either side with clips which we'll look at. The Ionic chiffon, again mirroring the Greek orders, differed from the Doric chiffon in terms of the overfold. The overfold was worn longer on the Doric chiffon. You'll understand what I'm talking about. So let's look 
at a Doric chiton, right? You can see what's going on here. There are two pieces of fabric and the front one has an overfold so it's longer and you fold it over to make sort of a flap. Um, sometimes a chiton was made out of one long rectangle which you would fold over and then wrap around you, right? You'd wrap it around you and then you would pull the, the front part and the back part up and clip it on your shoulders and it was worn open on the side. It's kind of hard to see what's going on here but look at these illustrations. This shows you how a Doric chiton worked. You see there's that one long piece of fabric. Sometimes it was two but that was kind of difficult to keep on. So think about one piece of fabric which is wrapped around and you see it's clipped together on the shoulder on that side. Then clipped on the other shoulder, that side, and then you can see the overfold there, and it is belted and it was open on the side, but there was so much fabric, you know, you didn't see the opening. And here it is in a statue form, and you can see her leg um, there, and um, so there would be a, a sort of a gap running down the si side, but so much fabric that um, it wouldn't be that apparent and it is clipped on the shoulder and we'll look at those clips in a second but as we know these chitons would be very colorful time robs history of color so this is what it would have looked like in real life okay here is the ionic chiton you can see it has a longer sleeve with uh, clips running up the sides and here again is a chiton uh, and uh, basically I think you can get the gist here. This is a garment constructed not by sewing but by clipping, wrapping and folding. It's warm in Greece. They didn't need a lot of stuff going on. Men wore chitons too. That was the mainstay of their garments. It is not a tunic because tunics were sewn. Two pieces of fabric that mirrored each other that were sewn together with uh, gaps for your head and your arms. A chiton was completely different. The second mainstay of ancient Grecian clothing was the peplos. Now this was sewn. You can see there in the diagram it was a tubular shape of cloth. So imagine you make a tube and you fold it over at the top and then you step into it. You pull the tube up and then you gather the fabric on each shoulder. You can see it here. So you have the tube which is sewn. You fold it over and of course you fold it over in relation to your height and then you attach it at the shoulder to give yourself an arm, uh, a gap for your arms. And here is another diagram that I think shows really clearly how it worked. So simple but so elegant, my goodness, it's a tube of fabric which would have been uh, colourful, it would have had some sort of pattern on it. Uh, stripes even, uh, or proto stripes, Greek keys, uh, flowers, uh, polka dots, I mean incredible, incredible designs. And this shows you the structure of a peplos. Unbelievably this actually started as a tube but look what just pulling it up and gathering it at the shoulder does. It makes really kind of Finally, the hymation. Basically, the hymation was a long piece of fabric, rectangular fabric, that was used sort of like um, a cloak. Not a toga. A toga is something different, um, but it's toga-like. Men would wear hymations with nothing on underneath. Occasionally a tunic if the weather was cold, but generally not. They would wear it like this um, and a woman would wear a hymation like a cloak and she would, you know, whether she was wearing her sheet on or her peplos, if she left the house she would wear her hymation and pull it up um, over her head to make a veil. And you can see a woman in a peplos there with her hymation. So, it's the sheet on, 
it's the peplos and it's the hymation. They are your three types of Greek clothing. And I think it's kind of funny that everything goes in three. The three Greek orders, the three forms of Grecian clothing. All right, we talked about how clips and pins sort of gave Grecian clothing its structure. Well, you know on the, the shoulders of the chiton and the peplos, I said that they were secured by clips. The clips have a name. They are called fibula. Fibula. This is what held Grecian clothing in place. And here are some examples of fibula. Sometimes they were very, very simple. And sometimes they were more decorative, usually made of uh, bronze, unless you were terribly rich, in which case they were made of gold. And sometimes they were very beautiful, so this acts as jewelry as well as uh, anything else. And I love this. This is a fibula fashioned to look like a bee getting pollen from a flower. So, shit on. Sheet on or shit on? I think sheet on sounds a little bit less uh, uh, rude than shit on, doesn't it? Let's go with sheet on. The peplos, the hymation, and the fibula. They are your Grecian. I want to touch a little bit on armor simply because uh, armor in um, the ancient world, and of course going through to the Middle Ages, was a very important part of the wardrobe of the era and, of course, the landscape of the era. And I really liked Greek armor. It was very elegant. These wonderful stylized kind of long helmets with these almond shape uh, holes for the eyes. Breastplates that were fashioned to duplicate and mirror the male torso. And then these wonderful shields and um, uh, calf protectors, leg protectors. But what I like best that really gives Grecian armor its look are these high stylized feathered plumes on the top of their helmets. Absolutely gorgeous. Footwear. Well, we talk about Grecian sandals today, so it'll come as no surprise to learn that the ancient Greeks wore sandals. These are replica sandals. You can see they are made of leather, they have soles, they have laces. They came in all kinds of different styles. And this is actually a pair of Grecian boots that has survived. So they would wear little boots as well. Let's talk about hair and headdresses in ancient Greece. Well, as you saw in the Minoan, and Mycenaean era, men grew their hair very long, but when we get to classical Greece, they cut it a little bit shorter. Women in ancient Greece had very long hair that they would spend an awful lot of time styling. Here is some blurb that you can read when you go back to review this uh, uh, PowerPoint. Slave girls cut their hair short or were told to cut their hair short, but during the Hellenistic era, hair was very long and quaffed. For guys, beards were, of course, a symbol of wisdom, but they too went out of style. Um, by the time we get into the Hellenistic era, male hair was shorter and we see more people being clean shaven. But let's take an actual look at some of these beautiful, complicated Grecian hairdos. Here is a whole variety of Grecian hairdos. These are all sort of taken from uh, statues and illustrated. You can see that there was a lot of accessorizing that went on in hairdos. A lot of braiding, often uh, a bun worn in the nape of the neck like this. Hair was nearly always worn up and you saw that it was down and flowing. Um, in the Minoan era, quaffed, yes, but long. When we get into Hellenistic Greece, hair was generally worn up and often braids and cloth were incorporated and intertwined and braided into the hair. And of course there was hair jewelry as well. Beads and pearls, etc. Um, that would be incorporated into hairdos and sometimes laurel leaves, etc. And this type of headdress, it's not really a tiara. It is a headdress that was worn, you know, on the top of the head like a tiara. And it has a name. 
It is called a diadem or diadem. A diadem headdress and this one is particularly beautiful it sort of echoes the friezes doesn't it on uh, Grecian architecture everything about this aesthetic um, sort of echoed each, each other and themselves it was very self-referential ancient Greece referenced itself and its own culture constantly didn't it we have a Doric chiton and we have Doric columns we have this headdress that echoes the friezes it actually looks like the top of a Grecian temple doesn't it so you can see what's going on here an extremely self-referential culture well Greece is still the word um, we still talk about Grecian drape and quite rightly because ancient Greece is still a huge source of inspiration on today's fashion runway. Take a look at this, it's like a peplos, isn't it? Take a look at this, it's like a sheet on all with this beautiful Grecian drape. Take a look at this, again, kind of a sheet on and a peplos with the overfold there. This is so gorgeous, I absolutely love it. A peplos updated. And take a look at this. This again has a sheet on effect. It, this uh, uh, the, the, the fabric at the front being wrapped around and secured with the fibula. Take a look at this. Completely ancient Greece. I don't have to tell you why all this stuff is inspired by sheetons and peplos and hymations, do I? This completely, and I kind of love this because it's so loose and flowing and um, you can really get a sense of how actual Grecian clothing was structured by looking at this runway shot. Stylists, creative directors and fashion photographers love Greek mythology because it's so dramatic and so full of exciting and unusual visual elements like this fashion shoot that of course is um, echoing Medusa the Grecian mythological character who had snakes for hair. I love this. Do you remember when I told you how much I loved Grecian armor because of these incredible um, helmets that really kind of echo the mane of a, of a horse, don't they? Take a look at this. And wow, take a look at that. Completely inspired by ancient Grecian military garb as is this, remember the breastplates, and look how her hair, with all of the, these wonderful hair pieces, has been styled to look like an ancient Greek helmet. And look at that, completely Grecian in inspiration. The Grecian folds, the hairdo, the whole vibe, as is this, as is this. Ancient Greece is so full of interesting, unusual, strange, exotic, mythical imagery that it always lends itself very well to fashion. <laughs>